So I'm so excited that we have Irene Del Rio joining us today. So Irene currently works as an assistant professor at the Austral University in Valdivia, Chile. So she received her PhD from Cornell University where her research focuses on understanding the genesis and evolution of hydrothermal deposits from a multidisciplinary approach, integrating petrological, structural and geochemical work. So with her expertise, trivia aside, <laughs> with her expertise, I am just so excited to hear from her today about using mineral, uh, yeah, mineral chemistry for characterizing the nature and evolution of an IOCG system. So it is going to be a great session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please use the chat. You'll have the chance to jump off mute and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so, so much for joining. It's just wonderful having you. Thank you, Jess. I'm gonna share screen now and don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about volcanoes. So I'm gonna be better at this than knowing the amount of volcanoes in Chile. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm gonna get started. Um, as Jess said, I'm gonna be talking about using mineral chemistry for characterizing the nature and evolution of an iron oxide copper gold system. So the work I'm gonna be showing um, to everyone today is um, mainly from part of my PhD and also part of the postdoc research I have been working on for the last few years. So we're gonna start with a very simple question, which is kind of like one of the motivations I have for studying IOCG deposits. So which is why do we care about IOCG deposits? So we think about um, a future where there's mostly renewable energy. Um, I like to think about that. We can see some of the main elements that we will need, for example, for wind or solar energy. And we find copper and iron ore, both that are actually found in IOCG deposits. So there is um, an important motivation to work on these deposits and understand them better in order that if we want to think about a future where there's mainly renewable energies. So IOCG deposits, what kind of deposit are we talking about? Uh, well, this type of deposit is very literal. They mainly have iron oxides, copper, and gold, which is why they're called IOCG. Uh, there's, they're widely distributed around the world, as you can see, um, and also um, in terms of time. So we have really old IOCG, IOCG systems as Karajas, which is from the Archean, and the younger ones are from the Andean belt, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And of course, the most important ones are in Australia. We have um, Olympic Dam, which is by far the largest one, the Concrete District and Tenant Creek. I have a plus minus in Palabora there because some people do not consider, consider an IOCG and I, I have to think about actually taking it out from this uh, picture, but other people do think that it could be related to this kind of deposit. So it's a controversial type of deposit, IOCGs, in terms of how they form. There's no consensus. They're so widely distributed around time also that it's difficult to find one genetic model that represents them all. So in that sense, it's pretty dif different from a porphyry deposit, um, which in, for us researchers is great because we have you know, a lot of subjects and things to work on and we're trying to understand these deposits. They contain, of course, significantly amounts of um, iron oxides, copper, and gold, but also other interesting elements such as um, silver, uranium, molybdenum, nickel, cobalt, which is um, really on fa in fashion today, and also rare earth elements. Uh, they're rich in iron oxides, of course. This could be magnetite and or hematite. So we have um, IOCG deposits that are, can, can have both iron oxides, one or the other. They have a strong, a strong structural control. And this is gonna be very important because our structure is very important if we wanna understand how these deposits form. And um, they're not related to an igneous intrusion. I mean, not in an obvious way, such as we see in a porphyry deposit. So this is important because we can't use these igneous intrusions for understanding how mineralization forms. And that's one of the main motivations I'm gonna, I have for presenting this talk. So, uh, so also when we think about IOCGs, it's easy to also think about iron oxide apatite deposits, also known as IOA. Uh, both deposits occur broadly contemporaneous or one just after the other. Uh, the area of Mina Justa, Marcona, and Peru is a great example where we have a strong IOA mineralization episode followed some years, million years after by an IOCG uh, mineralization episode. But in general, the main um, IOCG districts tend to happen with IOA deposits. So we find them together. We see that in the Olympic Dam district. We see that in the DM belt very strongly and also in the Kiruna district. So they host both deposits types. And what has been mainly proposed historically is that 
the IOCG systems are the upper part of an IOA deposit. So sort of like how we think about porphyry deposits and epithermal deposits, uh, we see IOA being the roots of an IOCG system, where we find in the deeper roots, uh, mainly iron oxide mineralization with no copper. And in the more shallow air parts of the system, we find the copper in the form of an IOCG deposit. So I want you guys to remember that model and think about it because we're gonna think about it a lot during this talk and maybe present some new ideas different to what we're seeing in this um, picture over here. So, well, the Andean IOCG belt goes from central Peru to central Chile. So it has a quite a bit of, quite a bit and or long extension. Uh, we have a lot of uh, deposits that are significant here, but the most important ones or popular ones are in Peru, Mina Justa or Raul Condestable. And in Chile, we have Manto Verde and Candelaria, and which is part of the uh, Candelaria Punta del Coire district that I'm going to be talking about today. So um, this district is just beside the city in Copiapo in northern Chile, like um, 10 hours north from the city of Santiago, the capital city. And it's the richest IOCG district of the Andean belt. Uh, the most well-known mine here is Candelaria, but there's actually 10 active mines in the district. So it's not only Candelaria, we have a bunch of other different smaller mines that are active at the moment. So in terms of geology, um, there is a, a bunch of different um, lithologies that we find, but the main lithology that where we're going to find mineralization is the Punta del Cobre formation. And this is a volcanic to volcaniclastic sequence uh, that goes between 135 and 132 million years um, old. So this is lower Cretaceous. And actually, if we see the map, it doesn't outcrop much. It's only these dark greens that we see over here. Um, on top of this formation, we have a marine sedimentary basin that's called the Chañarcillo group. That's mainly uh, sediments from also the lower Cretaceous. And on top of that, we have already, um, we're we are out of the marine sequence and we're into continental, continental deposits that we're not gonna mention here. So if we look towards the north uh, west of the district, we see a lot of pink colors, which um, we can translate into intrusive units. These all correspond to the um, Copiapo batholith, and we divide this batholith in three main units. The largest one is called Lavrea, and it's 118 million years old. So we're this is quite younger than the uh, volcanic unit where mineralization is hosted. Then we have the San Gregorio unit that is 115 million years old. And this one is very important for us because it actually has the same age than mineralization in the district. And then we have an, a younger unit that has 110 million years. And here we have some photos of the lithologies in the area. And one interesting thing to look at is that most of mineralization is hosted within this stratigraphic horizon where we have um, a day site uh, cryptodome and also some to fit. Um, the volcanic sedimentary units. And if we look at this horizon here, it actually can, we see different lithologies that are in this horizon to, um, throughout the district. And this is going to be important because depending on what lithology we find that horizon, it will um, control what kind of mineralization we find. So this uh, figure looks really simple, but it actually took quite a bit of time to put together. As I mentioned, there's 10 active mines in the district and they don't have only one owner, but they're actually um, four different companies, larger companies that are working in the district. And as part as of my PhD project, um, I actually went and knocked on the door on every, nearly every of these companies in order to ask them to cooperate and help me understand the district, like in a district, district scale, and that could be useful for everyone. And so this figure actually shows the main or um, main ore bodies in the district. Where we see the largest one over here corresponds to the Candelaria deposit. Here we have cross sections for each one of these um, ore deposits that we see here. And we can immediately see a large difference between the Western side and the Eastern side of the district, where the Eastern side mineralization is mainly hosted in veins with a strong North-Northwest orientation. Whereas towards the east, we see that mineralization is mainly hosted in this lithological horizon, um, horizon that I was talking about before. So here we can see how mineralization styles are controlled by ore lithology, or if it's in veins, we can actually conclude that it's controlled by structures. 
So in terms of myelization, as, as I just mentioned before, we know that the age of the main um, myelization event, the main copper event, was at 115 MA. Uh, we have that age, uh, it was dated using rhenium osmium some years ago uh, by Marshik, and then we actually confirmed that age using uh, uranium lead and different dikes that we found in the system. So we're actually pretty confident that the copper age is 115 MA. So in terms of how the rocks look like, so we have different styles of alteration mineralization uh, in the district. This is very litho lithology dependent, especially alteration. So when we're in the volcanic units, we will mainly see an alteration that is magnetite, with actinolite, biotite, and it's just pervasive in the whole rock. Then we have what is called the manto, which is basically this volcanic sedimentary horizon that I was talking before. We also see the same minerals, but alteration is way more pervasive and selective also. And we can actually still see the, um, the stratification of, this of some parts of the volcanic sedimentary unit. And towards the upper part of the sequence and towards the, um, the big intrusive units, we actually see some more SCARN style alteration. Then if we look at the mineralization styles, this is very IOCJ typical. So it's when, it, when it's in the manto, it's actually a horizon that has mainly calcopyrite, um, host in copper, but we also find mineralization in breccias, in veins, and we find different minerals that are characteristic of an IOCG, for example, like moschetovite, which is um, specularite replaced to magnetite, which is important because it actually indicates some important redox changes within the system. So this is kind of like what we know from the deposit just by looking at the rocks, you know, and there's a lot of things you can also say about the structural controls I'm not going to mention today. But I mentioned something before that is important that we don't have an intrusive unit that is obviously associated with mineralization in terms of like this is the source of mineralization. So in this sense, we don't have that many tools to understand how mineralization happened. So there's some questions that I thought were really interested to try and answer in order to understand this IOCG system and maybe you know, gather some knowledge that could be useful to understand other IOCG systems around the world. So for example, what about the hydrothermal fluids? Can we say anything about the fluids? We don't have any fluid inclusion data or not much because we don't have you know, that many quartz veins. What triggers and controls mineralization? And again, there's no English intrusion, so we need to use something else. So in that sense, we use a proxy. And a proxy, we can understand it as a variable that is used to stand in for one that is difficult to measure directly. And a great example to kind of understand this is how we use the rings and trees in order to understand the weather in the past. So, you know, we weren't here on the earth in the year 1798. But we can find trees that are that old and by looking at its rings and we can actually understand how the weather was and how it changed. So in that sense, we use the tree in order to understand weather and we can't actually measure weather directly because we, we're not alive at that time. So in order to use a proxy in this sense, in this, you know, for answering these questions, we will use mineral chemistry and mineral chemistry will be our main proxy to understand um, this IOCG system. And of course, using the chemistry of minerals that are associated with the formation and evolution of the system. Um, this is a beautiful pirate, pyrite map. It's not from my work, it's from a different paper, but I always love to show it because it actually shows these rings very similar as the, as the ones we see in a tree. So um, in order to do this mineral chemistry work, there's a lot of lab work that I have been uh, working on for the last years. Uh, mostly um, has been focusing on using synchrotron XRF, electron microprobe, laser ablation ICPMS. I've also done some in situ sulfur isotopes using SIMS and bulk sulfur isotope analysis. So there's a lot of lab work here, which means that we have to be very careful when we choose our samples because you know we can't do every analysis in every single sample we take. But it also means that I have the, had the amazing opportunity to collaborate and work with different researchers in different labs around the world. So that has been a very positive part of this work. So the first mineral we're gonna talk about is pyrite. Pyrite has a very simple formula, it's iron um, S2. Uh, the good thing about pyrites and one of the fun things about pyrites is that it's a sulfide that happens in a lot of different environments. We can find in sedimentary environments, magmatic, metamorphic, and hydrothermal. Therefore, it's very common. 
And what we like looking at at pyrite is not the iron or the sulfur, but actually the trace elements that replace iron or replace sulfur. As these trace elements will be different depending from what environment this pyrite was formed. There's another thing we can also look at in pyrite, which is its sulfur isotopes. We know there's four different sulfur isotopes and we can use the differences, the different ratios between these in order to tackle and um, understand the source of the fluids that were responsible of the precipitation of this mineral. Um, this is a technique that has been used widely in time, which is great because then we have some pretty standard values for the different oranges, origins of the source um, that for this kind of mineral. And here are some values that are important, but I have here in blue, uh, the most important value for today, which is uh, magmatic origin of the sources of the fluids. So um, pyrite is ubiquitous in most IOCG deposits. So we're not talking about a mineral that is difficult to find, it's actually um, pretty common. And it's very common, the Candelaria Punta del Cobre. And what I did is that we chemi I chemically and isotopically characterized uh, zoned pyrites. So these pyrites, uh, we discovered that were very zoned in terms of their um, chemical composition. And what we wanted to do is look at those zonations and see if they could tell us a story of how this mineral formed. So uh, we integrated and evaluated the use of different analytical techniques. We focused on quantified mineral maps. And here there's a, a big grain, chunky grain of pyrite. And we can see how the different elements change in composition and zonation within this single pyrite. So these are all synchrotron XRF map. Um, so what we looked at in these pyrites was the chemical composition and what we saw is that they have anomalously high cobalt and nickel contents. And this we can actually associate with a more mafic fluid source. So that's, you know, um, statement number one. And actually we look at the cobalt nickel ratios that we can also use that to trace the source of the fluids. We see that they're all within um, the range of ratios that we see in other IOCG deposits. So this is great. You know, we're not seeing very weird, weird data. We're actually seeing data that makes a lot of sense. And one of the main things we did um, in this study was actually integrate sulfur isotope data with trace element data. And this is important because we can use trace elements and sulfur isotopes as proxy for understanding similar processes and that will give us further information. And also this was a very, um, how can I call it, very detailed work as each point where um, I did laser work, I did the same, in, in the same point, I did the sulfur isotope work. So, you know, in order to integrate the two data sets. And we can actually use the ratio of selenium sulfur to understand also the source of the fluids in terms of it, it is magmatic derived, or if it is derived from external um, fluids, maybe evaporites, which is one of the main hypotheses of what, of, from where fluids that form an IOCG deposit come from. And the thing is that sulfur isotopes, we can use that for the same, um, with, for the same reason. And when we plot one against the other, we actually see a pretty nice trend where we, um, we can see that most of the samples are magmatic derived and most of the main mineralization samples are from a magmatic fluid, which is, you know, we're testing our, our hypothesis here. But we do see that some samples, which we know are later samples of later pyrite, show, um, show more of a external fluid signature. So in this sense, we know that the fluid responsible for the main mineralization event in the Candelaria deposit was a magmatic hydrothermal fluid. And by the end of this deposit, when it was formed, there was probably some participation of external fluids, probably from evaporites. So this is good. Uh, we can actually talk about the source of the fluid. So this is, you know, one of the first data we have used in mineral chemistry. So what can we, is there a way we can further characterize the temporal evolution of the mineral system? So how did this mineral system evolve in time and how did it change? So time here is a variable I want, I want everybody to think about. So these are two just paragenetical tables, very simple from Mina Justa and Candelaria. These are two of the most important IOCG systems. And one thing that uh, we can immediately see is that they have an early alteration stage that is rich in magnetite and actinolite. They even call it iron oxides, oxide stage in the Candelaria deposit. And after that, we have the copper rich stage 
but the copper rich stage also happens with actinolite and magnetite. So here we have two different minerals, alteration minerals that happen pre copper mineralization and sin copper mineralization. So here we have that time variable that I was talking about. So the main question here the main, that we want to answer is, does the composition of this mineral, of these minerals, magnetite or actinolite, changes in time? And can we use that, ch that change in composition in order to understand the temporal evolution of the system that ended up forming a really large IOCG deposit? So we're going to focus today on actinolite. Um, and this is a very interesting work. And I'm, very, I'm very happy I actually got to do it because there's not much work done on actinolite. So this was a little bit of a um, leap of faith when we, when we started with this project. We, we had no idea if it was going to be successful. And I will convince you, everyone, today that it was a very successful project that is actually still going. So actinolite is an ampable silicate mineral. It's a solid solution between uh, magnesium and iron and occurs in meta mainly metamorphic environments, but also in hydrothermal alteration environments, especially in IOCG and IOA deposits, which is why we're interested, interested in it today. So one thing we can see in this photo very quick is that uh, we have this beautiful pyrite, pretty coarse grain, we have calcopyrite, and we have these very coarse actinolite grains that we can see over here. And this sort of like vein is actually cut in alteration that is in the rock and the main host rock. And in this alteration, we can also see actinolite, but it's pretty fine grain. So we see one actinolite cut in another actinolite and where the earlier one over here doesn't have that much mineralization. So in this photo, I'm actually showing everyone that time, um, that time question that we're trying to answer. And we can see that we have these two different generations of actinolite. So the first thing uh, we did was do a very careful um, sampling of actinolite, we used one drill hole in Candelaria, a very long drill hole that has more than 1500 meters um, long. And we took systematically samples of actinolite and then looked at them first at, in unison and SEM. The idea was to try and identify if we could see any zonations within these actinolites, you know, any information rega regarding this time question. And we were pretty successful. We, um, it was not that difficult to find strong zonation um, textures. We find replacement textures where we have two different generations of actinolite. We find very strong overgrowth and also oscillatory textures. And the good thing about using the SEM is that these changes in color immediately indicate that there's a change in the composition of this mineral. So if we look at um, quantified WDS map, just looking at aluminum, magnesium, iron, and calcium, we can see very uh, strongly that aluminum, magnesium, and iron is very different within a single actinolite grain. And we see zonations that show um, consistent patterns where the earlier textures, like the core of this grain, show a higher magnesium content, whereas the later textures, such as overgrowth or replacements, show a higher iron content. So uh, what we did next, and this was kind of like the first part of this research project, was um, go back to an older paper that has been published in um, 2008 that used the iron and magnesium concentration of actinolite as a proxy for estimate and temperature. So originally, this is a, a paper that was published actually using samples from an IOA deposit and also synthetic samples from the, from the lab. Um, I mean, it's important to note that, you know, this idea here was to create a geothermometer. So it's a very, you know, exact in way of using actinolide with different minerals that has to be in equilibrium. But um, our idea here was actually use it as a proxy as an estimation for temperature. So the temperatures I'm gonna be talking from here on are ranges of temperature, but that fit really nicely the story of how this deposit formed. And also uh, I have some new data showing trace element um, concentrations of a, a different uh, actinolite that support really nicely what I'm gonna be showing you in the next few slides. So again, we use only iron and magnesium concentration of actinolite for what I'm gonna show you now. Uh, so we, we first use this proxy, uh, which is a polynomial regression. On different point data, we gathered using microprobe. Uh, we looked at this, at this information downhole. So this is our really long uh, drill hole. And the first thing we can see is that actually the average temperatures that we calculated for, for each actinolite grain show us a gradient. So we see that temperature gets higher as we go deeper in the drill hole. 
The other thing we see that is very interesting is that in terms of uh, percentage of interest in elements such as copper, gold, or iron, copper and gold are highly um, co um, coupled, as we see here, but iron not so much. We see there's some parts where the, we see high iron with high copper and gold, but then when we're out of the mineralization area, we're actually just seeing higher um, high iron contents, but not high copper or gold contents. So one of the cool things of this drill hole that we sampled, it actually crosses the whole deposit, the main ore bodies, and then it goes into barren rock, but it, that has a high alteration of um, magnetite and actinolite. So what we did next is we actually use the WDS quantified maps and thought these maps as an arrange of thousands of points where each pixel is a data point. And we treated the maps as thousands of data points where we actually um, did the same polynomial regression on the maps of uh, magnesium and iron. We did some Python code and worked where we applied this regression and what we got were quantified maps of temperature. So here we have um, the polymer regression applied to each pixel corresponding to actinolite and where each pixel corresponds to an estimated temperature. And what we see is that we have um, higher temperature cores and then the overgrowths are lower temperature. So again, the, the interesting thing about these textures and understanding them is that we are also applying this time idea in the textures of this, of this mineral. So here are the temperature maps that we did using this uh, technique. And what we see is that um, there's strong variation within single grains. We see that earlier textures show always a higher temperature and later textures um, show a lower temperature. So we see here there's, um, this, you know, there's a gradient that goes from earlier higher temperature to later lower temperature. But then we have some interesting grains like this one over here. We actually see oscillatory, hot, cold, hot fluctuations. That kind of tells that the story might be more complex even. Um, so what I did next is that I recovered each you know, pixel from these maps and did histograms trying to look for ranges of temperature. Um, the ranges are pretty you know, broad, but we do see some grains where we see very strong marked ranges that are quite different from each other. So if we put all these points together and we can actually do a larger histogram, and what we see is that there are two main clusters of temperature ranges. So we first have a cluster one over here that has a higher temperature range that goes from like 700 to 800 degrees Celsius, probably a little bit less. Um, and this cluster is our, our, our early textures. And one of the interesting thing is that this temperature range actually fits really nicely to temperatures that have been calculated for IOA deposits and not only using um, actinolite as a proxy for temperature, but also using oxygen isotopes. And um, so we have you know, different ways of understanding the, the temperature. Then we have a second cluster that is a lower temperature range. And this uh, cluster corresponds to the second you know, generation, or we can say, or later textures in actinolite, which also kind of, we, we tend to find them more in areas where we find more copper mineralization. And what we see is that this temperature range fits really nicely with the temperature range where copper is soluble in the hydrothermal fluid. So this is telling us that this cluster two was precipitated, you know, um, uh, actinolite was precipitated and being formed uh, it by a fluid that actually was in the correct range of temperature where copper could be soluble. So what are the implications for this? Well, we still want to think about when copper precipitated and actually fluids that cooled from 570 degrees Celsius, which is sort of like um, where our last data points are from cluster two, will start precipitating copper. So, you know, when this temperature grows lower, copper is not soluble anymore in the fluid, so it will start precipitated in the form of chalcopyrite. So looking at the data and interpreting it, we can actually see and suggest that actinolites that form cluster two would represent a copper-rich fluid responsible for copper mineralization in the deposit. And so what happens with iron, for example, why we see iron throughout the deposit? Well, iron has a way wider range of temperature where it's soluble. Actually, what makes iron precipitate mainly is changes in pressure. And here we're just looking at temperature um, changes in temperature. 
So that doesn't affect, affect iron so much. So we can see iron in the form of magnetite or an iron oxide in a um, whole larger range of temperatures. And this is the cool thing about um, all the, these data. Sounds, you know, a lot of geochemistry and, you know, just points. But if we look at the samples, if we look at the hand samples, we actually see the, the same things that we're talking about. We see this cluster one. This is a sample that is over a thousand meters deep, way past the copper ore bodies. And we do find this actinolite and magnetite only, which would correspond to cluster one actinolite. And then if we go to the main ore area where we find copper, we find again actinolite, but um, related and together with copper, with calcopyrite. So we can actually find and see these two clusters within the deposit. So using all this data and also using the data before that was showing you um, talking about pyrite and also understanding the importance of structures in the district that I didn't talk much about today because you know time, uh, we put together a genetic model for the Candelera district that we think it could be very useful in other districts, um, especially in the Andean belt. So we have to start you know, first thinking about the source of the fluids we talked about a magmatic hydrothermal source. So we need to have a ma magmatic system in order you know, to source these fluids. We know and we don't see it um, uh, you know, on surface. So we have to think about a deeper magmatic system that is origin, the origin of the fluids. So we can think about the system is really high temperature. There's a fluid accumulation on the top of this you know, mag magmatic body. There's overpressure. So the fluids cannot ascend, but this is all controlled by faults. You know? We have sinister faults, mainly north northwest that are controlled mineralization. And what happens if we move these faults? Once we move these faults, the fluids will be able to ascend. But this fluid is really hot, so it cannot transport copper, but it can transport iron. So what will happen? We will have this early mineralization, this, sorry, this early alteration stage, high temperature, our cluster one of um, actinolite, which will mainly be magnetite and actinolite. And in terms of temperature and mineralogy, it sounds pretty similar to an IOA. In terms, we don't have appetite, we don't have much appetite, it's just like microscopic. But basically, we can think about this of an IOA style mineralization event. So the magmatic system is cooling down, now our temperature is around 650. So what happens if the faults move again? The fluid that will ascend now will be in the correct temperature range for copper to be able to, sol to be soluble in ascent with the fluid. So he will, here we will not be only precipitating magnetite and actinolite, but we'll also be able to precipitate copper in the form of calcopyrite. We'll be able to precipitate pyrite also, and we will find all the other alter alterations that we see in the district. We do this again, re we repeat this, um, this mechanism, and by the end, we will form one of these IOCG deposits like Candelaria. And of course, we can have um, some uh, basin-derived evaporitic fluids coming in at the end, as we know it happens looking at the pyrite data. So this has strong implications for the IOCG and IOA models in terms of, you know, let's remember this vertical model where one fluid will be responsible for IOA mineralization. And as it ascends, then it will be able to form an IOCG deposits. So what we're seeing here is it doesn't necessarily need to be one fluid that changes. This can actually be different events that overlap. And just as a spoiler, um, probably some, some of you guys will be thinking about time. How much time does it ha does happen between one event and the other? And the answer is, from what we're seeing, it could be even millions of years. And also it could be that the source is not only changing temperature, but it's also changing composition. And this um, opens a lot of possibilities for exploration in terms that before, if we were over here looking at, we were just seeing IOA deposits, one would tend to think like, okay, so the IOCG part eroded, but if these events overlap, there's more chances of actually finding an IOCG deposit at the same um, stratigraphic horizon than an IOA deposit. So it opens possibility for exploring in areas with IOA or IOCG deposits. And just to finish, uh, what happens with actinolite? I said that we did microprobe work and laser ablation uh, work, and we've just been talking about iron and magnesium concentrations. Well, if we start looking at other elements, just this is just looking at sodium, aluminium, titanium, 
we'll start seeing that these same two clusters that we saw before, just using magnesium and iron, we can see them also. So we see similar patterns with elements that replace each other, for example, sodium and aluminum, but with different slopes. And this would actually, um, this fits really nicely with our early and main stage events. So we can also use trace element um, geochemistry here. And I use scandium uh, with a ratio of aluminum and sodium. And this actually helped us separate not only an early and main stage, but also separate our main stage malization um, samples in two groups. And what I'm gonna show you next is some work that we, I'm doing recently, looking at these subgroups and this early group and see if we can actually see differences in their geochemical composition of these different actinolites. So we know there's variation and not only of iron and magnesium, but we also see strong variations in aluminum and sodium. And if we look at titanium, these are laser ablation maps. We see, for example, cores that are higher concentration in titanium. We can also see different textures that are oscillatory within titanium. But we um, definitely see uh, early samples have a lower aluminum content. Then our main stage one has high, very high aluminum content. Sodium content just goes down from early, early stage to main stage two. Our titanium is higher in, main, in, in the early samples and our uh, fluor is higher in our early samples. And this is important for st both titanium and fluor because these elements tend to be higher in um, when the fluid source is more primitive or more magmatic. Then we can look at some trace elements like gallium, vanadium, zircon, or scandium. And what we see are again changes. Look at scandium has, it has some incredible zonations where we have you know, the core of some grains are really high in scandium. Um, we can see some parts of some grains that are high in scandium, others that are not. We also see changes in vanadium. And this grain over here is uh, very interesting because we see a core that is high in vanadium. This edge over here that is really high in vanadium and then the overgrowth is lower in vanadium. And we can actually see these three stages early, main stage one, and main stage two reflected in these laser maps. So the changes are not only um, magnesium and iron, it's not only temperature, it's absolutely compositional also. And then if we look at the metals, and this one I know is very interesting, first of all, we don't have any copper in these actinolite grains. We did some uh, very detailed um, laser ablation uh, data collection and copper is nearly always below detection limit. But we can look at cobalt, um, nickel, and zinc, and use zinc as a proxy for understanding copper. And we see that cobalt is high in this early stage, but it's also higher in main stage two. And then nickel is higher in main stage two, and zinc is higher in main stage two. So we have these two stages you know, of the main stage mineralization, and the later one tends to be higher in uh, metal concentration. And again, we see it in the grains. We see how nickel is enriched in the borders. We see zinc enriched in the borders of grain. It's the same thing we can see it in this grain over here with nickel and with zinc. So some observation, and this is all work in progress, what I'm showing you right now, is that we can see more than two distinct groups in these actinolite grains. Um, there is this early stage is not only higher temperature, but also has a more magmatic signature. And this by looking at titanium and fluor, which in appetite grains, appetite uh, minerals, it tends to reflect higher concentration of these two elements, a more magmatic um, origin, higher temperature signature. Looking at vanadium, this is a tricky one. Um, by looking at um, vanadium in magmatic environments, it tends to be um, more combat compatible in a more reduced environment. So maybe vanadium is redox sensitive, but you know we have to be wor working on this carefully. Uh, we know that high aluminum in magnetite indicates more high thermal conditions. So the main stage of mineralization here compared to the early stage has way more aluminum than the early stage. So we're looking at something that goes from more magmatic to more hydrothermal. Uh, cobalt and zinc are higher main stage too. And the, condi the solubility conditions between zinc and copper, um, copper are pretty similar. So we can use zinc as a proxy for, for when copper happened. And maybe higher nickel in the borders could indicate dissolution precipitation for sulfides. We know that sulfides are pretty um, rich in nickel in this deposit. Uh, we can also use scandium to kind of indicate if the source was replenished or depleted. So there's a lot of things we can actually look at in more detail of how the system evolved 
looking at temperature, of course, but also looking at the evolution of these trace elements. So just to finish on a high note, why, um, what is the goal of all this work when one of the main goals is to be able to use, use this information? Um, I like thinking that, you know, we can probably use actinolite chemistry in order to classify or understand where that actinolite comes from in terms of if it is IOA or IOCG. So this is just using iron, magnesium, um, sodium, and aluminum in actinolite from different deposits. Candelaria is our main IOCG deposit here. We can see this sort of like orange is dividing these two groups, where this one over here is our main stage, you know, copper um, event. And then we have this early stage, this more like IOA style mineralization. If we look at sample from El Romeral, El Romeral is an IOA deposit, it's an IOA mine here in Chile. We can actually then, um, see that most of the samples fall within this early IOA stage in Candelaria, which is the later IOA stage in El Romeral. But we do see some samples that have higher temperature, lower aluminum sodium uh, ratio, and seem to indicate a more magmatic origin. Similarly, we see that in Los Colorados, where we see one ore body, the main vein ore body, this is an IOA deposit, has a more magmatic signature, whereas the, the, uh, the a second ore body has a more magmatic hydrothermal um, signature. And we can see something similar for Liguera, which is another uh, one of these systems. So what we're seeing, like in summary, is a vector and tool that shows us if, you know, the satellite is of a more magmatic origin or more hydrothermal origin. Basically, if there has been more hydrothermal activity involved in the formation of this actinolite. I like to think that we're gonna test it actually that it could work using more portable um, analytical tools so, such as a, as a portable XRF. And basically what I am pointing at is probably Make, having a new um, exploration tool that could be useful and tailored for IOA and IOCG deposits. So with that in mind, I'm gonna finish and hopefully I convinced all of you today that mineral chemistry is great and it has been very useful at least for understanding this IOCG system. And I think that there's a lot of data here that could be applied potentially in IO, other IOCG systems, of course, within the Indian belt and maybe in other districts around the world. So thank you. Thank you so much. I feel yeah, so lucky that to have had you and thank you for sharing with us. I really, really appreciate that.